السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أوصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار We start by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Excuse me As all praises due to him And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send his peace and blessings upon his last and final messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم We can turn the volume up a little bit Is that loud enough? It's okay? <coughs> we seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's assistance, we seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. Thank you. We seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's protection, protection from the evil of our own selves and from the consequences of our deeds and actions. And we know that whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, then none can misguide them. And whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leaves to go astray, then none can guide them. And we bear witness that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his last and final messenger. And I advise myself and my brothers and sisters as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala advised us and as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advised us as well to have taqwa. And taqwa we mentioned time and time again is to be conscious and aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all that we say, in all that we do, at all times and in all places. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from a muttaqeen. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa always remind at the beginning of any of his talks that the best of words are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran and the best of guidance is the guidance of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And the worst of affairs in this religion are those things which are added or innovated by people because they would lead to misguidance which leads to the hellfire. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from it. We finished in our last uh, session a couple of weeks ago our series on the purification of the soul. So I decided it seems that, you know, mashallah, Sheikh is traveling a lot these days. So unfortunately, you will see my face maybe more uh, frequently. So we will choose a book so that we can do something, you know, uh, continuous or systematic, inshallah. Whenever the Sheikh is not around, I will continue on from this book. I think I may have given something from this book before. Uh, at this center, but I don't, I don't remember, subhanAllah. But the title of the book is, He Came to Teach You Your Religion. He Came to Teach You Your Religion. This is a quote from the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu We will talk about it in some detail today, inshallah. The entire book is an explanation of the hadith. You can see sometimes the scholars, they will write volumes explaining only one saying of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Or they will write volumes talking about one verse of Quran. Or they will spend hours giving lectures about one verse. So sometimes we don't give uh, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger وسلم, the time that they deserve. So you can find that when you when you go deep beyond just the surface, even this book is not the most scholarly, it's still written at a very uh, you could say, consider basic level. But look at how much they had to say just about one hadith of the Prophet. This book is the hadith of the angel Gabriel explaining the foundations of Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. And uh, the author is Dr. Jamal al-Din Zarabozo. Dr. Zarabozo is uh, an American who converted to Islam decades ago. And he became uh, quite uh, knowledgeable, mashallah, and scholarly. He's translated a number of books, written a number of books himself, and so on. He has a very detailed explanation of the 40 hadith of Imam al nawawi Imam al nawawi is a great scholar lived maybe about 700 years ago. He compiled 40 hadith that he felt are the 40 most important hadith. The Prophet ﷺ talked uh, in a good way about those who would preserve 40 of his hadith and pass them on. So many scholars compiled 40 hadith and put them in a fashion that people could memorize them and learn from them and so on. But most of them are not that famous. But Imam al nawawi has stood the test of time because uh, due to his uh, knowledge and wisdom, he chose some of the most important and best hadith. So this is one of the ones that he chose. 
and uh, we will talk a little bit about what the scholars have said about this hadith and how important it is in a Muslim's life. The hadith is a bit long, but we will go through and we will discuss it inshallah in some detail. And we'll try to cover in each session as much as we can. <clears throat> so, the hadith is known as the hadith of Gabriel, the hadith of Jubil. So, you would find that hadith would have nicknames sometimes. That people, scholars and so on, would refer to them in their writing or lectures, would refer to them in their speeches. And when they would say that name, it would be known exactly which saying of the Prophet ﷺ or which incident from the Prophet ﷺ's life they were referring to. So this one is known as Hadith Jibreel or the Hadith of Gabriel. It's one of the most comprehensive Hadith of the Prophet ﷺ because you find that it touches upon almost every deed of Islam. Qadi Iyad, one of the great scholars from our history, he pointed out that this hadith covers or points to all of the aspects of internal and outward acts of worship of Allah. It touches upon the deeds that are related to the external organs as well as that of the heart. Indeed, he stated, it covers the religion to such an extent that all the religious sciences are founded in it and branch out from it. So you can imagine how important this hadith is. To the point that the scholars gave this hadith the name of Umm Sunnah. Umm as Sunnah. Umm means mother. So when you use the word mother in Arabic, many times it means the origin or the foundation or the basis upon which something is laid or something that is representative of that entire thing. So when they call it Umm as Sunnah, meaning it's the foundation of the Sunnah. What is the Sunnah actually when we want to define the word Sunnah? Can anyone define it for me? <coughs> What is the Sunnah? Uh, anything that does as long allowed, anything that does as long as silent, anything that does as long deep is Sunnah. Okay. The brother said anything that the Prophet ﷺ allowed, anything that the Prophet ﷺ was silent about, and anything that the Prophet ﷺ did. Okay. This is partially covering it. The Sunnah has different definitions, of course, depending on what field or science within Islam you're talking about. So different specialists or different scholars and so on in the Islamic sciences would use the word to refer to or mean different things. But in general, when we use the word Sunnah, we are talking about the sayings, the actions, and the approvals of Prophet Muhammad So those could be uh, tacit approvals, meaning that he would clearly state that this is something acceptable, or he may remain silent, as our brother said. If the Prophet remained silent about something that was done in his presence, it means he approved of it. Right? So when we talk about the Sunnah, we are talking about again the actions, the sayings, and the approvals of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So you'll find that this hadith is narrating an incident that occurred. Part of it are the words of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but a good portion of it is the companions narrating what they saw, what occurred, what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did, what the other people and parties involved did. Now this is called Umm Sunnah. In the same way that we find Surah Al Fatiha is referred to as Um Al Kitab, right? The foundation of the book or the foundation of the Quran. So in Fatiha, you find it summarizing the entire message of the Quran, actually. You will find, for example, somebody like Dr. Jamal Zarabozo, he spent 35 hours explaining Surah Al Fatiha. <clears throat> Can you imagine? He has a 27 CD collection. It's more than 35 hours, maybe. Just talking about seven verses of Quran, Surah so Fatiha. And so you can find that this kind of very uh, a comprehensive portion of the Quran or the Sunnah, it's encompassing so much from deep meanings. So, in the same way that Surah so Fatiha encompasses the meaning of the Quran as a whole, this hadith encompasses the meaning of the Sunnah as a whole. According to Ibn Hajar, this incident took place close to the Prophet Sallallahu death. Why is that important? <clears throat> Why is it important when this took place? Can anyone have, have any insight on that? So sometimes you may read a number of ahadith, you may find that they are saying different messages. So you will find that you will feel, oh, there's some contradiction between these two sayings, for example. It becomes important to go back and look at the chronology. When was this said? Where was it said? Why was it said? So for people like us, if we just open Bukhari and we start reading, very dangerous. 
because you will begin misunderstanding and misinterpreting because you don't have the proper context. Similarly, the Quran, you have to understand Asbab al Nuzuri. What's the reason for revelation? Why was this verse revealed? Where was it revealed? In, re in reference to who was it revealed? When was it revealed? And so on and so forth. So the scholars, many times when they are first explaining the hadith, they will identify when did this take place. Because different things that occurred there will be in relation to what has been revealed from Quran thus far. So maybe they will they will narrate in, in that incident something that occurred which is no longer allowed in Islam. But at the time when it occurred, it was okay. It occurred before alcohol was prohibited. It occurred before hijab was made mandatory, and so on and so forth. So you may find that something that's occurring there only occurred because it was still allowed at that time. So it's important for us to take that into account. <coughs> Some say that it was just before the farewell, farewell pilgrimage, which was at the end of the Prophet's life. Hence it was as if the Prophet وسلم, through the questioning of the angel Gabriel of this hadith, was summarizing his mission and message. This is at the end of his life. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending the angel Jibreel to ask these clear questions in front of everyone for everyone to have it. And it's been recorded for us over 1,400 years ago. We still can have the exact and precise definitions. What does it mean when we say Islam, Iman, Ihsan, and so on and so forth. Now, we have to uh, discuss that in a separate discussion, but we understand that the Sunnah was preserved very meticulously in a fashion similar to the Qur'an. So we find that the Sunnah was recorded, the Sunnah was memorized. Today, you can sit with a Shaykh and learn this hadith from him, and he can give you a chain of narration back to Prophet Muhammad So it can say that you memorized or learned this hadith from him, he learned it from his Shaykh, who learned it from his Shaykh, all the way back to Prophet Muhammad yeah? And I've met people, as I told you before, that memorized Bukhari, Muslim, Six authentic collections of ahadith, the nine authentic collections of ahadith, you're talking about tens of thousands of sayings of the Prophet ﷺ, they memorize them with chain of narration. You can tell them, please read from me, for me from book such and such, chapter such and such. They will begin reciting it, just like it's Quran. So this is uh, uh, you know, something miraculous, but something that Allah ﷻ has provided an army of people who have preserved the authenticity of this religion. In other religions, you may find that these things are mixed together. So the Bible, you'll find it's a collection of sayings of, of Isa salam, sayings of his disciples, sayings of other people that came even generations later. People, uh, some of it may be the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still. So all mixed together. But in Islam, we have these things clearly separated. Quran is the word of Allah. The Sunnah has the sayings of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa clearly defined as his words and then the narrations of the companions describing things that he did and so on and so forth. And then beyond that, a separate category, we have sayings of those generations that came after from the righteous scholars and so on. So we don't allow these three to get confused or mixed together. <coughs> he summarized the essential concepts of Iman, Islam, and Ihsan. Then at the end, he stated that the person who came to discuss this with him was Angel Jibreel, Angel Gabriel, who had come to teach them their religion. Uh, this hadith is the second hadith in Imam al-Nawi's famous collection, right? What's the first hadith? What's the first hadith in Imam al-Nawi's collection? It's one of the first hadith in, in, in majority of collections of hadith. Yeah. It's, a, it's talking about niyyah, but every Muslim should have it memorized actually. Every Muslim should know it. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالْنِيَاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مِرِئٍ مَا نَوَى Indeed, all actions are by their intention, and everyone will only get from their deeds that which they intend. And then the Prophet ﷺ goes on and gives examples. Whoever migrated for the sake of Allah, that's one thing. But if you migrated for money to get some kind of uh, financial benefit or marriage or whatever it is, then that's all you'll get out of it. So this was one of the, the pillars of Islam. Sincerity and intention is at the heart and key to every action. But after that obviously comes doing things in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet And here we find in this hadith that the actions uh, uh, essential as pillars of Islam are defined. Once we have clarified that our intention has to be sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now he says this, uh, in this particular hadith, okay we leave that. 
uh, the author says this is the eighth book that he knows of that's written only explaining this hadith. So seven other books throughout history, full you know uh, publications, just written commenting and explaining this hadith. So I don't think I'm going to recite it in Arabic because maybe uh, uh, people would not understand the benefit from that. But we'll read it in English. On the authority of Umar radiallahu anhu, Umar ibn al-Khattab, who said, one day while we were sitting with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, there came before us a man with extremely white clothing and extremely black hair. There were no signs of travel on him, and none of us knew him. He came and sat next to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He supported his knees up against the knees of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he put his hands on his thighs. He said, O oh Muhammad, tell me about Islam. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Islam is to testify that there is none worthy of worship except Allah, and that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah, to establish the prayers, to pay the zakah, to fast the month of Ramadan, and to make the pilgrimage to the house if you have the means to do so. He said, you have spoken truthfully or correctly. We were amazed that he asks the question and then he says that he had spoken truthfully. So we will discuss this in more detail, inshallah. He said, tell me about Iman, about faith. He, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, responded, it is to believe in Allah, his angels, his books, his messengers, the last day, and to believe in the divine decree, both the good and the evil thereof. He said, you have spoken truthfully. He said, tell me about an ihsan about goodness, about excellence. He, the Prophet sallallahu answered, it is that you worship Allah as if you see him. And even though you do not see him, you know that he sees you. He said, tell me about the time of the hour, the day of judgment. He, the Prophet sallallahu answered, the one being asked does not know more than the one asking. He said, tell me about its signs. He answered, the slave girl will give birth to her master and you will see the barefooted, scantily clothed, destitute shepherds competing in constructing lofty buildings. Then he went away. I stayed for a long time, then he, the Prophet wasallam, said, O oh, Umar, do you know who the questioner was? I said, Allah and his messenger, no best. He said, it was the angel Jibreel. He came to teach you your religion. So this is one of the narrations coming through Ahmed ibn al-Khattab. We'll pull a little bit from some of the other narrations because there are a number of companions that narrated this incident and some of them added some additional details here and there. So the text, we'll come back to that later inshallah. This hadith from Ahmed ibn al-Khattab was recorded by Muslim at tirmidhi and Nasa'i ibn Majah, Ahmed, Abu Dawood, al Bayhaqi, ibn Hibban, uh, Ibn Khuzayma, Al-Bazar, Abu Ya'la, Al-Tarqutni, and a number of others. These are all the na names of famous hadith scholars that compiled or included this hadith in their collections. The scholars of hadith differentiate hadith by their text, as well as by the companions who narrated the hadith. So this particular hadith has also been narrated through acceptable chains from the following companions, Abu Huraya, Ibn Umar, Ibn Mas'ud, and Al-Hadith Al-Ash'ari. So the narration from Abu Huraira has been recorded by Al-Bukhari, Muslim, Ibn Majah, Ibn, Ibn Shayba, Ibn Hibban, and others. So this is something from the science of hadith. Maybe for us it sounds strange or we're not familiar with that, but the scholars will look into that. This hadith that you just mentioned, you can't say the Prophet said just like that. Who said the Prophet said that? Who are the scholars that compile all this? And, and reported it, who are the companions, what is the chain of narration that it came through and so on. The scholars will look into that into great detail. Even within the chain of narration, they will analyze who is this person, when did he live, where did he live, did he really meet this person that he claims he narrated the hadith from, was this person known as his teacher, did he really hear from him directly, how is it confirmed, is he an honest person, is he trustworthy, and so on and so forth. There are people that dedicated their entire life to studying that. And that has been compiled for us and so on and so forth. So the sunnah has been preserved in very meticulous fashion. This, it's important for us to learn about that. Many Muslims unfortunately don't have maybe very much information or details about that. Now what are the circumstances behind this hadith? So just like in Quran we will look at the reasons for revelation. Now we look into what, 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 what caused this incident. 
So the scholars, they give some explanations. In one of the hadith in Sahih Muslim, one of the narrations of this hadith, uh, Jubil alayhi salam begins in the following manner. Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu narrated that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, now this is narrated by Abu Hurairah. The first one was narrated by who? The one I mentioned first. By who? Umar ibn al-Khattab, right? So now two different narrations of the same incident. They were all there attending. So Abu Hurairah narrated that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu said, Ask me, meaning ask me about matters related to the religion. However, the people abstained from doing so because they were overawed out of profound respect for him, sallallahu alayhi In the meanwhile, a man came there and sat near his knees and said, Messenger of Allah, what is Islam? So now the Prophet sallallahu knows that his life will come to an end. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has informed him. Right? So we know in Surah Al-Nasr, in Ajaab Nasrullah al fath already the Prophet Sallallahu knows at that time his life will end soon. So the Prophet Sallallahu is making sure now everything is sealed, clear, the message is complete, everything is summarized. So the Prophet Sallallahu is asking people to ask, they have any confusion, they have any questions, any doubts, this is your time. You ask, Allah will reveal the answer through me. So people, they felt shy. Some of the companions, they would say, if you ask me to describe the Prophet Sallallahu face, I would not be able to do so. Because I never looked at him in the face. Too much uh, uh, respect. And they would hold the Prophet Sallallahu in such high esteem that even when they were just around him, they would lower their head. They wouldn't even look at him directly in the face, some of them. So they would say, they could not give you a detailed description of what he looked like. Can you imagine? So they would feel shy and the Prophet ﷺ would ask them questions. Would they answer? Would they answer his questions? No. What would they say? Allah and His Messenger the best. Because they said maybe the Messenger ﷺ will give a new definition. Will give a new answer for what he's asking. Different than what we already know. So we just stay quiet. Unless he insists. The Prophet ﷺ sometimes would insist that they give an answer. So you can imagine how much respect they had. So because of that, Abu Hurairah was saying the people were not answering, so Jibreel came to ask the questions that needed to be asked. So the people would know the answers and it would be also preserved for future generations like us. According to Al Ubay, the reason the Prophet said, Ask me, is because they were, they were asking many questions and the Prophet realized that some were asking obstinately. Therefore, he became angry and said, Ask me. Ask me, for by Allah, you will not ask me about anything except that I shall tell you about it as long as I am standing in this place. So now there are different groups of Muslims. Obviously, there are hypocrites. There are many different people that are amongst the ranks of the Muslims. So some, they may ask, not for the sake of knowledge. And we, we can see that sometimes you'll be in a class and the person asking the question, he supposedly already knows the answer. He's asking only to try to stop the quest the, the person he's asking to try to cause some debate to show off that he has knowledge whatever it might be the intention is not good so the prophet sallallahu doesn't want these kind of questions he's looking for sincere questions for people that are asking to learn to understand they're asking relevant important questions not waste of time silly questions for example sometimes we will go into details what color was the shirt that he was wearing exactly who cares why is that beneficial knowledge not beneficial so the idea is asking about the right things, the important things. So the Messenger وسلم, told them, anything you ask, I will answer it right now. Allah will reveal the answer to me. Now after the Prophet وسلم, spoke in that way, people became nervous to ask. So after hearing and seeing this, the people became fearful and refrained from asking any questions. They didn't want to be from those that the Prophet وسلم, was upset with because of the type of questions or the reason behind the questions they were asking. So when the people refrained from asking questions, Allah sent the angel Jibreel to put these important questions to the Prophet And you can see that both of these explanations can fit together actually. There may have been some that were asking too many questions, but not the right questions, not for the right reasons. Others that had the good intentions were feeling very uh, uh, shy and were in awe of the Prophet so they felt they couldn't ask or they didn't want to speak up. As Sanusi adds, that such questions do not go against the prohibition of asking questions. 
you know there's a prohibition of asking questions. So actually one must ask these type of questions because the answers to them are needed. Right? But the prohibition is what? The prohibition is about asking questions that there are no need to ask. So we see, for example, Bani Israel, Musa salam says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you, slaughter a cow. So they came back, they said, what kind of cow? Well, the cow should be like this and like this. What color should the cow be? Well, the color should be like this. You know, still we couldn't find the right cow. Give us more details about the cow. So it became more and more difficult for them, for them. So the Prophet Sallallahu has already told us, you don't ask these kind of questions. There are some things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't reveal the details about and that's easier and better for you. The more you ask, the more you will get the details and then it will become difficult for you to do it. So the Prophet sallallahu would warn from asking too many questions in that context. But asking about the basics and something that we don't understand and so on, there's nothing wrong with that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الْفِكْرِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, So ask of those who know the scripture if you don't know. If you don't know the answer, then you go to people that do know, that have knowledge, you don't make your own fatwa, you don't guess, you don't just try to interpret your Quran or Sunnah on your own, but you go to people of knowledge and ask about things which you are not sure. In other words, there's a type of questioning that should be avoided and a type of questioning that is commanded. Questions of a useless nature or of a purely theoretical nature with no benefit to them are to be avoided. But questions for which answers are truly needed must be asked. Hence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the angel Jibreel alayhi salam to ask him these questions and to demonstrate that important questions like these are to be asked of the people of knowledge. Who better to go to than the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi salam to ask, especially while he is still alive. So, let's go into the, uh, into the hadith itself. Now, the different narrations of the hadith referred to earlier describe the appearance of the angel Jibreel alayhi salam. So at the beginning it says, on one, on, on, uh, one day while we were sitting with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then it says a man came out, he was wearing very white clothes, his hair was extremely black, there was no signs of travel on him, it's describing in detail. Number one, this shows you how precise the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were. So they used to hold it a very important responsibility to pass on knowledge precisely. Because they understand they have a responsibility as the messengers of the Messenger of Allah. So they are leaving things for us in full detail. This is exactly what happened. This is the incident. This is even how the person looked. Can you imagine? So they were very uh, keen and they were paying attention. But now, this scenario and the way that it occurred also drew their attention in. So the scholars comment on the way Jibreel came. They don't know it's Jibreel now. He just came in the form of a man. Jibreel as an angel is something maybe unfathomable, huge. The Prophet saw Jibreel in his natural form twice. So when he saw him, he said he filled the entire horizon. Anywhere I look, I cannot see anything but him. He had 600 wings. With one wing, he can destroy the earth. That's how large he is, how huge he is. Yeah. So Jibreel is just one of the creation. Not talking about, for example, the angels that carry the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only eight angels carrying the throne. And you cannot fathom how large and magnificent the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. So the angels are very powerful, very magnificent creatures. We know about angels that they only obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's command. So we don't believe as Christians do that there are fallen angels, for example. So for them, they would say that the devil or shaitan is a fallen angel. That he was an angel that disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, لا يعصون الله ما أمرهم ويفعلون ما يؤمرون. They don't disobey Allah subhanahu wa taala and what He commands them, and they do precisely what He asks. Angels they cannot disobey Allah. They don't have free will like human beings do or like jinn do. So we know jinn are another category. Shaitan was from amongst the jinn. So jinn some are good, some are Muslims, some are bad, right? And shaitan can even be used on human beings, as Allah subhanahu wa taala has done so in the Quran. There are shaitan from the human and from the jinn, meaning they are those who disobey and go against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and become extremely evil. Yeah. So Jibreel alayhi salam now can come in different forms. He comes now in the form of a human being. He comes in the form of a human being. And that happened a number of times with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Yeah. So now he comes to this gathering. First of all, 
he's a stranger. When people look, even in one narration, it says they looked at each other, they said, who is this guy? They don't know. He's not one of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu that they know. So, he's a stranger. Second thing is, his appearance shows that he didn't just come from out of town. A traveler in the desert, well, his clothes will be dusty, his hair will be messy, you know, you're coming through wind and sandstorms and this and that. There's no way you're going to come and your clothes are perfectly white and your hair is like combed and, and dark black. It's not going to be like that. So they, they notice this. He's a stranger, but he doesn't look like he came from out of town. So they were looking at him like, who is this guy? Then the way he behaved made him, and the way he was dressed and appeared, made him seem like he's a Bedouin from the desert. So the Bedouins, they have a different way of behaving than city folk. Right? So even now, we may differentiate between company and, and city. The manners, the behavior is different. People are different according to what they grew up in, the, the environment and so on. So at that time, the Bedouins, they're very tough. They're very coarse. They're even considered rude by city folk, ill-mannered. Why? Because that's the nature of the environment they live in. It's a desert, it's a tough environment. So they also became tough people. So they shout, they talk loud, they don't have some kind of manners. The, bad, the Bedouin will come into the masjid, for example, in the Prophet's time. He's a new Muslim, he doesn't know. He starts peeing in the corner. He starts urinating in the corner of the mosque. So the other Sahaba are like, this is a house of worship, what's crazy? So they wanted just to get him out and throw him out. How come he's peeing, he's desecrating our, our house of worship? For him he doesn't know, he just wants to use the toilet. He thinks he can do it anywhere like he would in the desert normally. So he just went in the corner and started. So the Messenger said, leave him, leave he doesn't understand, right? So just let him finish and then we will explain to him after. Yeah? So the Prophet will treat them in a special way because sometimes they don't understand or they don't have that etiquette that everybody else had. So this man was behaving now in that way. He came, for example, there's a group like this. Imagine he comes from the back door there and he says, Muhammad, Muhammad. He starts shouting his name like that. So the people are like, what's going on? Who does this guy think he is? Yeah. We're in the middle of a class, middle of a group. Everybody's sitting quietly. The messenger saw so him. People have respect for him. They don't call him by his first name. Never. They don't call him Muhammad. No. They say, O oh, Messenger of Allah, O oh, Prophet of Allah. They call him by his title. So this man comes and he shouts his name like it's his friend. And then he's standing back there. He's interrupting the whole group. And he says, let me come forward. So the messenger saw so says, come. So he steps through, and the people at that time, they will sit close. They're all close to the Prophet and they're all packed together. A lot of people want to be able to hear what the Prophet is saying and so on. So he's stepping over people. This is rude. They call it cutting the neck. It's considered very disrespectful in Arab culture. How come you just step with your leg over my head, over my face? You know? You can imagine. So even this is prohibited in Friday prayer, for example, right? You come late to the prayer, the place is packed. You cannot just cut to the front like you're like you're a king or something. Who are you? You just sit in the back where the where the gallery ends. You don't have a right to just come late and then go all the way to the front. So this man he keeps asking, let me come forward. He says, come. So he keeps stepping over the next, over the next, over the next. He comes all the way to the Messenger Sallallahu And then he puts his knees against his knees and he puts his hands, some said they interpret it as he puts his hands on the Prophet Sallallahu legs. On his thighs like this. So the people are like, man, who is this guy? What does he think he's doing? And he's going all the way there and he has so much audacity. He sits like this right there like their best friends. And he puts his hands on him like that. And they're getting a little bit uh, upset. So they're paying now close attention. So this whole thing, the scholar said, the main reason behind it is to draw in their attention. So now they're really focusing and listening. What is he going to say? And the most important thing that they're going to hear what? The answer of the Messenger وسلم, so that they will learn. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is creating this whole scenario now so that they're paying very close attention. But the scholars, they gleaned a few things from this, although it's a bit contradictory, but they gleaned a few things from this, which they said should be taken as etiquettes of students of knowledge. Number one, his appearance. He was very clean. He was well-dressed. So they said those who want to seek knowledge have to have respect for knowledge. You cannot come in your pajamas, in your dirty clothes. We see that sometimes when a lot of people go to Friday prayer, in clothes they would never go to the office in. In clothes they would never go to a wedding in. In clothes they would not be caught dead in a jusco or a giant in. Right? When they go to Friday prayer, that the shirt is like torn, 
the armpit stains are showing. How come? No respect for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for worship, for the house of worship, for the knowledge you are coming to learn. So they said that you see from his appearance very clean white clothes, his hair is nice. So they said those who are, are teaching knowledge or seeking knowledge have to give it proper respect by, by dressing appropriately. And this shows your, your sincerity in wanting to learn. And this is an important uh, action in regards to seeking knowledge. So you would find somebody like Imam Malik, they would ask him to narrate a hadith. He would go for a while and then come back. So he came back wearing like fresh clothes, putting new turban on, putting perfume and everything. Then he says, okay, now I'll tell you the hadith. They wouldn't even say the words of the Messenger Sallallahu if they're not sitting in a proper position, if they're not dressed appropriately. They considered it, considered it respect for the Messenger of Allah and Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala because these are their words. Yeah? When you are mentioning the Quran, you are mentioning the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu The second thing that they gleaned from this is the way that he went all the way to the front and sat very close to the Messenger They said it's very important for those who are serious about seeking knowledge that they come early, that they sit in front, that they sit close to the one that they are learning from to ensure that they hear properly, that they understand things properly and so on. Now because of the advent of the microphone, so people come early but they sit all the way in the back. They want the comfortable seat with the chair or against the wall or whatever it is, even in the messages and so on. So the scholars, they talked against that. They said, no, the, the, the etiquette we saw from the Sahaba, that they would sit very close to the Messenger Wasallam. They would come early to be in the front to ensure that they would capture all of the knowledge out of respect for those words. It's not necessarily out of respect for the person saying that, but for what they are saying. Yeah. So these were some of those kind of etiquettes. They mentioned the way he sat. He sat in a humble way, actually folding down his knees, bending down. He didn't stand and talk to the Prophet I said in a very disrespectful way. And the way that he put his hands and so on, for those that interpret it as he put his hands on his own legs, they mentioned that this is a humble way to sit before your teacher. So you can see that the scholars, they would, they would analyze or give some commentary on all the aspects of the hadith. We went through some pages, but we still didn't even get into the hadith actually. Just describing the scenario and so on, they would document all of this kind of information for us. So we can see that this whole scenario now has drawn in the attention of the people. Now, for example, they mentioned Jibreel alayhi salam is calling the Messenger وسلم, by the name Muhammad. Oh Muhammad. And this is prohibited in the Quran actually, explicitly. Now, the scholars begin to debate. Did this occur before the prohibition or after the prohibition? So if it occurred before the prohibition, no problem. But if after the prohibition, how come an angel of Allah will commit this thing? Right? So they look at this, they begin to analyze. So they said, this incident occurred when? This hadith occurred when? When did we say? Huh? Close to the end of the Messenger Sallallahu life. After uh, the final pilgrimage. So there's not much time left in his life. So meaning the verse prohibiting addressing the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam like that, which the Bedouins would do, they would come outside of his house and they would begin shouting. Huh? They don't knock on the door. Muhammad! Come out! They would shout it like this. So the, the, the messenger cannot be addressed like that. You, you, you're not in the, in the alleyway and this is one of your, your friends and you just start shouting to him on the balcony, come out. You cannot address the messenger like that. This is what they were doing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited that and told them, you don't call him the way you call him your friends. You have to have respect for him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already revealed this verse. So how come Jibreel is doing this? So they come with some explanations. They said there are three possible answers that have been given to this question. Just to give us some idea about how the scholars would, would analyze. Number one, they said the prohibition of such an address applies to humans only and not to the angels. So the angels are messengers of Allah as well. So now it's a messenger addressing a messenger, it's a different story. So you would hear about the messengers of Allah, I said in the Islam and Mi'raj, maybe he will talk to the messengers, they address each other by their first names and so on, something normal. Yeah? So this is one possible explanation. Number two, this event occurred before the prohibition of such an address. 
Some said maybe that's possible, although this explanation seems unlikely since the event took place so late in the Prophet Sallallahu life. Number three possible explanation, they said, this was done to further the appearance that he's a Bedouin Arab and he doesn't know. So everyone else was kind of paying attention, what is he going to do next? They're just waiting to see, like, is he going to embarrass himself more? Or what, what, what is he going to say? So they're listening closely, okay? So now he asks his first question, and he says, tell me about Islam. What is Islam? Now the thing that shocks them is he asks these questions after the Messenger وسلم, answers, what does he say? He says, Salat. That's right. You're correct. <laughs> This is very rude. You can imagine somebody comes to you, asks you the question, you try to explain to them, you really want them to learn, then they tell you, yeah, that's a good job. You're right. <laughs> it's like, why did you ask me? You already know, you're embarrassing me, you're testing me, what is this? So the, the people are also surprised and shocked. How come you will ask a question, then tell them, yeah, you're correct, and your answer is the right answer. So let's hear, in, the, in his reply, the Prophet وسلم, he doesn't give the linguistic meaning of the word Islam. Is that right? What does he give? What was his response? The five pillars of Islam. He gives actions. This is what comprises the foundation of Islam. But he doesn't say what does the word Islam mean? Is that right? He doesn't give that definition. Why? Because for Arabs, it's already very clear. Islam means and this Islam. Surrendering, submitting. They already know what it means. But for us, maybe we don't know, so we just look at the definition real quickly, inshallah. In the same way, he also didn't give the linguistic meaning of the word Iman, right? When the Prophet ﷺ asked, perhaps because these concepts were something very clear and the Prophet ﷺ realized that the person was asking about what makes up Islam and Iman and not the definition of these two, two words. So, when we talk about the dictionary definition, right, lexically, then the word Islam implies submission. But in the context of this religion, what does it mean? He quotes from Mu'mani, uh, Muhammad Mandur Mu'mani in his book, Meaning and Message of the Traditions. So he says, literally Islam denotes self-surrender or to give oneself up to someone and accept his overlordship in the fullest sense of the term. This is the meaning of the word Islam linguistically. In the religion, in this religion now, the religion set down by Allah and brought into the world by his messengers has been called Islam for the simple reason that in it the bondsman yields completely to the power and control of the Lord and makes the rendering of the wholehearted obedience to Him the cardinal principle of His life. That becomes His goal. To fully surrender and submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the sum and substance of the Islamic creed. So sometimes it's important for us to go back to basics. We say, I am a Muslim. But then, Islam only touches and affects our life one hour once a week. Friday prayer, or in the Sunday class, or whatever it might be. But how about the way we do business? How about the way we treat our family? How about the way that we will uh, run the, 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 the country? How about the way we will seek education? How about the way we will do this or that? No, that's a different story. So then it means you miss the, the mark completely. The definition of the word Islam means continuous self-surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why Dr. Jalal Zarabozo in another book, he has a nice definition. He said to be a Muslim, it's not a, it's not a state that you become. One day you're not a Muslim, then you become a Muslim. But it's a continuous process of trying to be. You have to continuously strive and work. You cannot just say, I'm a Muslim, now finish, guaranteed paradise. Don't have to worry about anything. Don't have to strive. The way I am today is the way I'll be tomorrow, is the way I'll be after a hundred days, it's not like that, no? The person has to be continuously improving, continuously striving to truly be submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be from those who can be uh, considered those who He's pleased with and uh, Allah is pleased with Him and He is pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Islam is to testify that there is none worthy of worship except Allah. So the word in Arabic is La ilaha illallah. So how do we translate La ilaha illallah? Literally, how should it be translated? Well, if nobody knows, then 
That's true. Close this book and we go back to step one. Okay. Just the first part. Yeah. La ilaha illallah means there is no God but Allah. Yeah. But if you understand the term properly, then you will say that this is incorrect definition, incorrect translation. Yeah. Because the way that it's worded in Arabic, this is why it's important for us to understand the Arabic language. The way that it's being worded here, it's a very strong form of of, of or syntax for writing a sentence. Because you begin with a negation and then an affirmation. Yeah? So we could just say there's only one God and there's no other God. Yeah? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say it like that. It starts the other way around. There is no God at all worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? So that's why in Arabic they say, La ba'ud bi haq illallah. There is no one that deserves or that is truly worthy of that worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there are a couple couple elements here. Number one is that if you want to plant the seeds of Tawheed, Tawheed is monotheism, truly believing in one God, submitting yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Step one in the process is removing all the kind of weeds and rocks and so on from your heart to be able to plant those seeds. But if your seeds are full of, if your heart is full of loving others more than you love Allah, fearing others more than you fear Allah, putting your trust and depending on others more than you do Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and so on and so forth. These are all obstacles to that tree of Tawheed properly growing in your heart. That's why the scholars said it's so beautiful that the statement starts with a negation. If you stop with only the first half, then you're, a, you're an atheist basically. There's no God. What does that mean? There's no God. So that has to be the first thing. Now, the word God here also in Arabic is important to understand. Ilah. Ilah means the thing which people worship. So are there many gods in the world? There are millions. And just in Hinduism, my, my, my uh, friend who was Hindu and converted to Islam, he said, we have millions of gods. I said, are you serious? He said, yeah. I said, if we just give five minutes for each one, we will not be able to worship all during our lifetime. And that's what he told me. So I mean, there's a there's a temple for the rats, for example. That the rat is a god. That the male reproductive organ is a god. That the, this is a god. That animal is a god. That human is a god. So many possibilities. Once uh, a friend told me he took some students, Muslim students, to a Hindu temple just to observe what is their religion, to learn and so on. So he came and he found they were having a celebration. So he said to the, uh, I don't know if you would call him a priest, for example, in the, in the temple. He said, what is the celebration? He said, it's a birthday for one of the gods. So he said, which god is it? He said, you know, to be honest, I'm not sure. <laughs> but it's a birthday and we are celebrating. So what does that mean? You don't know even which one it's for? How can, how can it be? And you are the religious leader for that temple and so on. So there are many, many gods. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about how a person can take as their God their own desires, their own whims, whatever they feel, whatever they want to follow. They just follow their own lusts and passions and so on. That becomes their God. The Prophet sallam mentioned those who took money as their God. Or even he mentioned they took fashion as their God. We find now people, some, some documentary talking about women in, in, in parts of Asia that are selling themselves when they told them why they said because we want to be able to afford the latest fashion what? so you don't have any principle of what's right and wrong as long as it can get you the latest fashion I need Gucci, Versace, whatever it is so I'm willing to do anything whether it's right or wrong to get that money to be able to afford fashion fashion became a god for you now what is this? because the god is something that you obey something that you will determine what is right and wrong based on that object or that person or whatever it might be so there are many, many gods, millions in the world that people have taken, whether humans, animals, planets, this and that, and so on and so forth. Yeah? So the first thing that we say in Islam is that there are no gods. None of these gods are worthy of worship. None of them. None of them deserve because they are not the creator, they are not the sustainer, they are not the provider, they are not the protector. They cannot even do anything for their own self, much less for anybody else. How could they be deserving or worthy of worship? Yeah. So this statement is a very powerful statement and that's why when the Messenger of Allah وسلم, came to the 
Arabs, they understand the language. So, for example, when he would meet delegations, he would tell them, they would say, tell us what is your message, what are you calling the people to? He says, I call the people to La ilaha illallah. They said, oh, this is a big one. They would say like this, they said, the people will fight you because of this word. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa in the very beginning, he was shocked. He said, they will, they will fight against me and expel me. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa has a sterling reputation. He's loved by all. When the tribes were fighting, before he's a Messenger of Allah even, they were fighting and they're trying to decide who will put the black stone when they're trying to rebuild the Kaaba. They said, bring Muhammad. Bring Muhammad, he will decide who should do it. Can you imagine? He's loved. So now that they're telling you, the people will fight against you for this statement only, because you are saying this. He said, what? How come? How come I'm just saying this? But they understood the connotation of this statement. It means all your idols, which are making you rich, which you are using as corruption, which you are controlling the world and the people. Now Quraysh, they are in control of the Arabian Peninsula. They are loved and respected. Their caravans can go to Syria and come back and they will travel through all kinds of dangerous territory and the highway robbers will not touch. But they will raid any other caravan except for Quraysh. Why? Because Quraysh is controlling Mecca where the idols and the gods are sitting. Yeah? So Quraysh, when they hear this statement, even though they know it's true, they said, ah, now you are touching money, you are touching power and control, you are touching the status quo. This is so already those who understood, like Waraq ibn Nawfal was from those who, who was following the, 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 the Hanif religion, the pure religion from before and so on. So he already knew about Musa alayhi salam, other prophets and messengers. So he saw that this is going to come. You're calling just to this word, just this one statement, it's going to cause you problems. People are going to go and turn against you. Subhanallah. Ajeeb. And you are just telling people, worship your creator, only Allah. And we can see until this day, people are being killed because of this word. People are being put in prison because of this word. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who truly testify to it and give us steadfastness to remain on it until we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the other thing about this word is that it's called a shahada. It's called a testimony. Yeah? So a testimony is a big word even when we think about it in our context in the worldly life. If I say come to court and testify, you say, oh it's a big deal. Testify to what? Testify that you saw this and this happen. So now you'll ask yourself, did I really see it? I can't just go and testify like that. It's a big deal. Judge is going to ask me. I'm going to have to swear an oath. I'm going to be held accountable if I'm lying. I have to make sure that I can commit to that testimony. I may be questioned or, 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 or assaulted because of it and so on and so forth. So they understood how weighty of a statement it was. It's not just a cheap word you say like that and that's it. But it's a word that you say it means you're going to really commit to it. Yeah? So they have all of this understanding just from the linguistic phrasing of the word. The Arab, when they heard this, they understood what it meant. For us, we need a bit of explanation maybe because it's not our native language. <clears throat> now, La ilaha illallah, we believe it's the statement by which people will enter paradise. Is that right? But, La ilaha illallah has conditions. Has conditions. It's not a statement that you just say with your tongue and automatically it's a go to, go to paradise free card that you're given and you can just access any time and you don't have to worry about anything else in your life. We can find that some Muslims live in that way and we find that in many other religions this would be a claim as well, but we don't know that this statement has conditions. It has conditions that have to be fulfilled. Muslims know that the key to paradise is the statement, there is none worthy of worship except Allah. Yet many Muslims simply rely upon this statement and believe that as long as they have said it, nothing will harm them. Because of this mere verbal statement of the Shahada, they think that they will be granted paradise. However, the mere saying of the statement is not sufficient for salvation. In fact, the hypocrites used to say, I testify that none is worthy of worship except Allah, and yet Allah describes them as liars and says that they shall abide in the lowest abyss of the hellfire. So just merely saying the word doesn't mean much. As many scholars have stated, this statement or testimony is the key to paradise. However, its saying must uh, meet certain conditions. Al Hassan al Basri once told a person, What have you prepared for death? He replied, The testimony that there is none worthy of worship except Allah. Al Hassan told him 
that has some conditions to it. And beware of defaming chaste women. The famous scholar Wahab ibn Munabbih was once asked, isn't the statement of La ilaha illallah the key to paradise? He answered, yes, but every key has its ridges. If you come with the key that has the right ridges, the door will open for you. Yet if you do not have the right ridges, the door will not open for you. So sure, a key is a key, but you put it, it doesn't necessarily open the door. You have to make sure that it has the right grooves and the right ridges. So he's saying if La ilaha illallah is the key to paradise, there are conditions to ensure that it will give you access to paradise. These ridges are conditions that differentiate Muslims who will benefit from the statement from those who will not benefit from that statement no matter how many times a day they might have made that statement. Yeah? So we need to be cautious and aware from you know being those who say, I just said this word and that's the maximum amount of commitment that I need to give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't matter how I live or what I do after that. Before discussing the conditions of the shahada, there is one more point that should be made. Some people have a tendency to take one hadith or one verse and then based on that one text, they make a general conclusion solely based on that one text. So this is very dangerous, right? We mentioned that if you just open Bukhari by yourself, which is a collection of the most authentic sayings of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and you just begin reading here and there. Today you decide you only to read one or two pages and you close the book. If you go and make some decisions or take action based on that, oh, you might be far off from the truth. Far off from the truth. Because there are many other hadith or ayat which are related, many other sayings of the Prophet Sallallahu or verses of the Quran which are related to that. About the same topic, they have to be taken all together in context. You don't just take one. So sometimes it'll be laughable when we find people who are attacking Islam, for example, they come up with a pamphlet. And I've seen that in America, in English. This is what Islam teaches, look. And it's like, what? This is half of a verse of Quran. Where's the other half? You didn't even finish the sentence. Did you read what the other words say? And they know, but they say, cut it. Take it out of context. Show the people. And they use it against Muslims. Huh? They would line up in front of the mosque after Friday prayer and hand it out. Look what your religion teaches. Did you know that? And people are like, oh, oh really? I don't know. It's like, yeah, open a book, read, run. Right? How come you're just being fooled by somebody? And he even put dot, dot, dot there. He's showing you something is missing. Just read the rest of the statement. Go and find the other hadith or ayah talking about this topic. Understand it in the right context. Yeah. So they will bring these kind of uh, uh, sneaky tactics. <coughs> so this is something that we need to be cautious. For example, one could conclude from some hadith that whoever simply says there is no God except Allah will enter paradise. Because the Prophet ﷺ stated it in that kind of clear format. But actually, one must realize that all of the Quran and hadith complement each other and explain one another. That's why the message went on for 23 years. Otherwise, everything would have been just in one day and finished. This is it. A few words and take it. But no, it came all together, the entire Quran, the entire Sunnah, together. To find the correct position on any one question, one must bring together all of the related verses and hadith and see what the true Islamic position is on that question. The same is true for the conditions of the Shahada. So if you want to understand the conditions of the Shahada, you have to look at a number of different hadith and ayat talking about these conditions, maybe only one at a time, to understand what all of them are. So the scholars came up with seven in general. A study of the verses of the Quran and the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ will find that the conditions of the Shahada are seven. Uh, eight or nine in number, depending on how many you use them. So you can, you can break some of them down further and it can become up to nine conditions. I think I covered them in this center before, is that right? Does anyone remember? I did, right? Yeah. How many people heard, heard those lectures before? So, no, we, we will cover them again, alhamdulillah. Yeah. We'll talk about the, uh, the first condition, I think, and then we'll, we'll end there, is that right? What's our, what's our time like? Until 12.30 maybe? Okay. Bismillah. The first condition is knowledge. Knowledge. So what does that mean? It means one must have the necessary basic understanding of what is meant by the shahada, by the testimony. You cannot testify to something 
like uh, sometimes people would tell me a story. They said a guy was giving lecture, introduction to Islam, and it was all non Muslims. Then he told everybody, raise your finger, say after me. And he said it in Arabic, and they all repeated He said, you're all Muslims now. He said, what? They don't even know what you're talking about. What you're saying, you just said it in Arabic, and you told them, repeat after you. It doesn't mean anything. What are you talking about? So, of course, the person has to have knowledge about what the testimony means and what it implies. Is that right? One must understand what the Shahada is affirming and what the Shahada is denying. Allah says in the Quran, this is the verse of Quran that we use to refer to this, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَلِكَ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, So know that there is no God except Allah and ask forgiveness for your sin and for the believing men and the believing women. Yeah. So here, Imam Bukhari, for example, he put the, the, the title of the chapter and he included this verse there. He said, Bab al-ilm qabl al-qawli wal-amal. This is the chapter of knowledge before actions and, and sayings. Means, before you do anything in Islam, you have to have knowledge about that thing. So sometimes we find that people pray, but Allah only knows really what, how they're praying or what they're praying. When you come and say, did you ever learn properly how to pray? He says, yeah, I just saw some people how they do it. My parents told me like this. My grandfather once mentioned this. And I just do it, put it together and see what comes out. This is not real prayer. How come you don't ever sit down and properly study the right way to pray, the right way to fast, the right way to give zakat, the right way to make hajj, the right way to do anything? Yeah. And the scholar said, anything that you are related to, you have to properly know how to do it. For example, you are a businessman then you have to study the rules and regulations of business in Islam. How come you go out into the marketplace? Umar ibn al-Khattab, he clearly announced in the marketplace that he was the Khalifa. He said, anyone that doesn't know the rules of halal and haram in business cannot do business in our market. No, go back. Yeah. So, we have to ask ourselves. We are engaging in certain things that we understand the right way. Now you are a father or a mother. You understand what that means in the Islamic context. Now you are a spouse, you understand what the rights are, what the obligations are, and so on and so forth, and you studied about that. You are now a, a, a prime minister, a governor, a leader of this organization, or this business, or this country, or whatever it might be. You have to study what does that mean in Islam, and so on. So whatever role you are playing in life, it becomes incumbent upon you to seek knowledge about that specific area. Before you just go in and do action, and then you say, well, I didn't know what's halal and what's haram. Ignorance is not a uh, is not bliss, as they say. It's not an excuse, just like that. Why did you know? Take some action, learn, seek knowledge. You have to ask. You have to try to uh, uh, ascertain what's halal, what's haram, what's the right way, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Similarly, the Prophet ﷺ said, "Whoever dies knowing that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah shall enter paradise." Yeah. So here, the Prophet ﷺ stated this condition explicitly in one of his hadith. In fact, the shahada, sorry about that. In fact, the shahada itself is a testimony. When one testifies to something, one must know what it is that he is testifying concerning. Obviously, a testimony that, about something that one does not have any knowledge of is unacceptable. You come to court. Did you see this man stealing? You have no idea. You're like, yes, I did. Sure. Yeah, it was him, for sure. And he had two people with him, and they were like, you start lying and making things up. We would say, you don't have any knowledge about it, you cannot testify to that thing. Allah says in the Quran, save him who bears witness unto the truth knowingly. Another evidence. Therefore, the basics of the shahada must be understood by the person testifying to it. If he does not understand, for example, that Allah is the only one worthy of worship, and that all other gods are false gods, then he does not even have the most elementary understanding of what it is he claims to be testifying to. And I tell you from my travels in the Muslim world, I see Muslims who commit shirk. They worship graves, they worship jinn, they do this and they do that. But this is the basic shahada says there is no one worthy of worship except Allah. So it means you didn't even understand that. This is horrible catastrophe. So it's important that we have proper knowledge and understanding. Such a shahada cannot be considered a proper one that is acceptable to Allah. Now if somebody were to read the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ here, the Messenger ﷺ said you have to have knowledge. So if he only stopped at that, would that be a correct understanding? We would say definitely not. 
Although there are some people that said belief in Allah is only knowing knowledge. Some some misguided groups in the history of Islam, they would define Iman like that. They said Iman is just to know that Allah exists. Anybody who knows Allah exists means they're a believer in Allah. We would say then that means Shaytan, the devil, is a good believer. Because he knows without doubt for certain that Allah exists, he talked to Allah, he dealt with Allah more than we have. He knows he has knowledge and the next condition that's coming up even is certainty, no doubt about it. He has full certainty. Yeah? But these conditions alone are not enough. Shaitan is not someone who submitted to Allah and he decided to obey Allah and to really do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. He's not willing to commit to the meaning of that shahada. Right? So just mere knowledge we can understand here when we look deeply, that's not enough. So many people in the world today who are even non-Muslim, if I ask them, do you believe in God? They will say, for sure, yeah, I know he exists. Okay, but are you willing to worship him, to obey him, to follow the lifestyle that he wants? Or not? So, what does that mean? Just knowing that he exists, it's not very much. Allah has already placed in the nature of all mankind knowledge that there is a creator and that he is there and wanting to seek him out. That's already there by default, right? So just knowing this fact or even being certain of this fact is not enough. Fir'aun, the greatest enemy of any of the prophets and messengers perhaps that's ever lived. The, the one who went against Musa, Moses, and his uh, people, the children of Israel, yeah, Musa alayhi salam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about him that he knew for certain. They were certain about it inside. That Musa is a messenger of Allah and that Allah exists already, he was certain about all that. But that wasn't enough to save him or enough for him to be considered a believer. So the other conditions are also very important. We'll, we'll, I think we'll stop there. Is that, is that fine? We'll cover the other conditions in a future session? Or should we continue on a little bit more? What does that mean? Yes or no? Continue on? <laughs> yes? Okay. Let's go a little bit more then. The second condition of the shahada is certainty. So the first one is ilm, ilm, knowledge. The second one is al yaqeen, al yaqeen, certainty. Yeah? This is the opposite of doubt and uncertainty. In Islam, in fact, any kind of doubt concerning anything confirmed in the Quran or the Sunnah is equivalent to kufr or disbelief. So we tell you now that Jibreel came in the form of a man and he talked to the Messenger. Anyone who says, I doubt that happened, I can't accept that, that's not feasible, I don't believe it, or something like that, we would say this is a problem. This is a problem. Confirm the Messenger said this, and this incident was narrated to us by trustworthy companions, and so on, and you cannot reject it. You cannot reject it. Yeah? Anything that's mentioned in the Quran from paradise and hellfire and the day of judgment and the hereafter, and so on and so forth, a person has to have full certainty about that. Once you establish the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists and He is the Creator, and there is great wisdom behind His creation of this universe, it's a wisdom that is obvious by His qualities and attributes which are obvious from His creation. We don't even need to go to Revelation. Just look at the creation. You can see how magnificent the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, and you can know that He wouldn't create all of this for nothing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they think we just created this for fun, in vain, just like that. No, no, no accountability, no justice, no mercy. Nobody will be held to account for what they have done. No one will be rewarded for any suffering they went through. Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seem like that kind of creator or that kind of God? Of course not. That doesn't fit with his qualities and attributes and what we can accept as human beings. So once you confirm this fact, then you know that necessarily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had to send revelation and prophets and messengers. And when you look closely into the life of the final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when you look closely into the revelation, you can ascertain for certain that this is from Allah and no one else. It cannot be from a human being. Especially Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was living 1,400 years ago in the deserts of Arabia and he was illiterate. So you confirm that this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once you once you've submitted to these two facts, no other discussion needed. But scientifically, like one guy was considering himself an atheist. Arab. 
So we talked to him, he said, okay, yes, I'm convinced there is Allah. Okay, but then if you believe in Allah, then there is a way that you should follow. Okay, he began to pray, he began to change. He came to me one day, he said, what is this feeling I feel inside? I don't understand it. I said, what are you talking about? He said, it's a good feeling, I feel very calm, but I don't know what, what's going on, where did it come from? I said, subhanAllah, you, you are submitting to Allah, you are following Allah's way. Why, why wouldn't you feel that way? And you don't, you don't expect that something good would come out of that? He said, I don't know, I'm surprised. He wasn't expecting that Allah, subhanAllah. So anyways, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided him, but then he will have debates with Muslims on small issues. So they were mentioning to him about the beer. So he said, uh, bring me scientific evidence about the beer. <laughs> Prove to me about what did the scientists say about it and so on and so forth. Scientism. But for sure there are benefits in anything that we do as Muslims. Physically, in this life, and so on and so forth. But irregardless of all of that, you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you believe in the Messenger sallallahu alayhi you automatically believe and accept anything that comes from them finished. It's confirmed. It's confirmed authentically that they did say it. And end of story. If it's not confirmed that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi said it, that's a different story. Or what's the proper way to interpret or understand something? Also, this can be another story. But the idea is that you will outright reject. Unless you can bring me scientific evidence, I cannot accept this thing. But scientific evidence. 50 years ago, what they believed scientifically is laughable now. Laughable. People today will say silly, silly primitive people back then. How come they used to believe that? How come they used to do that? Don't they know how bad that is for their health? Don't they realize this? Don't they realize that? And 50 years from now, people will look back at us and say the same thing. Backwards people, how they used to live, our grandparents and so on, right? They will talk like that, subhanAllah. As science develops, we learn new things, we start changing our opinion about a million different things. Within the past 10 years, they, they, they differed on the universe. First they said, it's, it's, going, it's not uh, uh, expanding anymore. Then they said, no, it is expanding. Then they said, oh my God, it's expanding more rapidly. Then they said it's going to explode and tear apart. Then they said, no, it's going to implode. So make up your mind. Which one is it? How come each time you are just changing your opinion like that every couple of years, right? This is something that we were studying about in astronomy and so on. So, so Pala, if you just will base your life on, on scientific theories and so on from human beings, definitely it's full of flaws. One day they will say this, the next day they will say that and so on. Uh, one example, we, we, we mentioned it many, many times before maybe, but we can mention it again. The hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned that if a fly falls in your drink or your soup, you have the choice. You can dump it out and go on drinking. Or you can dip the fly into the drink. It's on the surface, it just lands, it's dead, right? You can dip it into your drink, pull it out, throw it, and then drink it. So, scholars of the past, not too long ago, they said, no way this hadith is authentic. Because now scientifically we know about germs. And this is disgusting. How come you will dip the fly full of bacteria into your drink and then drink it? Somebody's lying. The Messenger of Allah never said this. But it's confirmed through an authentic chain of narration. He said it for sure. No doubts about it. So now they discovered later on, oh, there's bacteria on one wing or leg of the fly. And there are antibodies to those bacteria on the same fly. So if the fly falls on the surface, maybe you will get the bacteria, you will be harmed by it. But if you dip it in, then the antibodies are there too, you will not be harmed by the bacteria. So the Messenger of Allah did he have micron, mi micro, micron uh, uh, microscope or whatever it is at that time? He didn't have such a thing. Did he investigate further about bacteria and new cultures and test it and figure this out? Of course not. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already revealed to him, this is a rule, take it or leave it. So the Sahaba at that time, their automatic reaction was, We heard it, that the Messenger of Allah said it, we obeyed it, finished. No need to question it because you know the source. It's like even in your life now, sometimes someone will tell you, hey, so and so said this. And then you will say, you want to double check with him? No, you're telling me he said it, finished, I don't need to double check. Or he really said that and confirmed, I don't need to double check on that because of how much trust I have in that person, because of how much I uh, hold their opinion in high regard, right? You have a guru in stocks, he tells you sell. You're like, are you going to go for, do further an investigation? No way, he said sell, I'm selling, and he knows. Finish, I go and I sell my stocks, right? So you have someone who has some kind of expertise. Now you're getting revelation from the creator of all things. 
the manufacturer of all these things is telling you the proper way to use it like this. Then you will come and say, no, no, come on. I think there's a better way to use it. Are you sure? Let me check. Let me double check. Let me ask this other user. This is the manufacturer is telling you this is the way to use it. Finish. How come you will debate and argue and stuff? SubhanAllah. So this is the issue of certainty. <coughs> Uh, one must in his heart be absolutely certain of the truth of the shahada. One's heart must not be wavering in any way when one testifies to the truth of there is none worthy of worship except Allah, the creator of all things. Allah describes the true believers as those who have belief in Allah and then their hearts waver not. Allah says the true believers are only those who believe in Allah and his messenger and afterward they doubt not, but strive with their wealth and their lives for the cause of Allah. Such are the sincere. Yeah. Similarly, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi said, "No one meets Allah with the testimony that there is none worthy of worship but Allah, and I am the Messenger of Allah, and He has no doubt about that statement, except that He will enter paradise." This is recorded by Muslim. Excuse me. Yes. You'd like to? Because the word A you use the word B to be worship, except Allah. The meaning of Allah. Say, say, it, say, it, say it again. Okay. No. Oh, did I say that? That there is none worthy of worship. To be. There is none worthy to be worshipped. Okay. It means the same thing. There is none worthy of worship. Meaning of being worshipped. Yeah. Uh, this is the way that you word it in your English, but what you are saying is the correct meaning. That there is none worthy of being worshipped. Yeah? Not that there is none worthy you know, to do the worshipping. Obviously Allah does not worship anyone, but Allah is the one that should be worshipped. Yeah. I understand what you mean. Jazakallah Um <clears throat> So now... Um, Okay, here they give us, he gives an exception. He says, an exception to this is related to the case of ignorance, where one is doubtful about something and is not aware that it is proven in the Quran and Sunnah. But once the person knows that something is definitively confirmed in the Quran or Sunnah, there is no excuse for him to have any doubt about it. So if you're not sure and you want to confirm and you ask and double check, there's nothing wrong with that. But once you are certain, then it's something that you should be willing to accept without a doubt. But now we come to the issue of Iman and faith. We'll talk about it more in another section. But somebody might say, sometimes I feel like my Iman is weak, my Iman is down. It's not always so strong, it's not always at the same level and so on. This is something natural. We know that uh, Iman is equal to Iman increases and decreases. Iman goes up and goes down. That's something natural. And we know that it increases by doing good deeds. And it decreases by doing bad deeds or staying away from doing the obligations that we need to do. So somebody sometimes will feel, okay, how can I get my iman to increase? Your iman will increase by doing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks you to do. The more that you do that, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open your heart, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase your iman. Until we can try to reach, as we'll talk about later on this, to the highest level of ihsan, to the level of excellence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet Sallallahu described, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you see him. So now when we talk about certainty, we're talking about being certain in the unseen. So what would it be like if you could see? How would you behave if you could see paradise and hellfire? How would you behave if you could see what the Day of Judgment will be like? How would you behave if you could see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you at all times? It would be a different story for many of us, right? So the highest level is that, no, your level is such that the way you are now, even if you could see, there would be no change. No difference. This is the way the Messenger of Allah and his great companions were, if you can imagine. Yeah? They were living in such a way that as if the Messenger, as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there with them now. Even just go lower than that and say, what if the Messenger of Allah was with us now? He's amongst us. How would you behave? How would you be different again? SubhanAllah. Right? So this is the kind of certainty that a person is striving for, but it's different levels, it may take time. And we have to be willing to show that sincere sacrifice. Am I willing to sacrifice some of my time, some of my effort, some of my money, some of my energy for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Am I willing 
when I have these choices between make some money here and do something haram or not get that money but obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and please him. Are we ready to make those kind of choices and to head in the right direction and find that our iman as we go will inshallah increase. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the other hand describes the hypocrites as those whose hearts are wavering. So for example Allah says, they alone seek leave of you not to participate in jihad, who believe not in Allah on the last day and whose hearts feel doubt. So in their doubt they waver. This is a surah of Tawbah, verse 45. Many scholars have stated that the disease Diseases of the heart or the doubts and suspicions that one allows into one's hearts are more dangerous for a person's faith than lusts and desires. So we mentioned before two categories of things that can really corrupt a person's heart and take a person astray. One are temptations and desires, one are doubts and confusion. The way to close the door to desires and temptations is through patience and perseverance. And this comes from worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala committing to prayer, committing to fasting, giving charity. This is breaking those desires and controlling them. So the person is not greedy, not stingy, not overly indulgent when it comes to food or sex and so on and so forth. But a person that is well-grounded and living a healthy lifestyle. That's one half. The second half are the doubts and the confusions. Now the way to close that door is through sound, authentic knowledge. Knowledge. Sometimes you will find yourself when you're at a certain level, you will hear a statement from somebody, maybe it can send your head spinning. What? Is that really like that? Did Allah say that? Did the Prophet say that? What does that mean? Uh, uh, uh. Then you go to somebody with knowledge and they calmly answer you and they say one, two, three, and then you say, Ah, oh, I see, okay, amazing. And the next time you will hear someone talking about that, you will smile and say, How come they're making such a big deal about it? It's very clear, nothing confusing about it. But subhanAllah, when we don't have knowledge, when we don't have proper understanding, we can get very confused about small matters. But the more knowledge you have, the more confidence you begin to have, the more you realize and understand. Of course, not just knowledge as in information, but interpreting that knowledge and understanding it correctly is also very essential. And that's where you have to turn back to the Prophet his companions and the righteous predecessors and scholars that came after them and so on. Yeah? Uh, <clears throat> this is because lusts and desires may be satisfied at some time, yet the person still knows them to be wrong. He may then eventually be able to control himself, repent, and give up on those evil deeds. On the other hand, doubts and sus suspicions may linger in the heart with no cure until the person finally leaves Islam entirely or continues to practice Islam while in fact in his heart he does not have the true faith. So this is why those kind of doubts and confusions are, are like a cancer that need to be taken care of immediately. You cannot allow it to grow. You have to go and seek knowledge and consultation with those people who have proper knowledge and understanding so that they can guide you and help you to understand those issues correctly. One of the greatest cures for these doubts is knowledge. A sound knowledge of the Quran and Sunnah removes most or all of these doubts. By study and understanding, one may, turn, may attain certainty. And as one studies and learns more, his certainty will be made firmer and firmer. Yeah? So I think we'll end there, inshallah, and we'll, we'll, we'll continue on in our next session, which I'm not sure when that will be. But uh, the third condition of the shahada will be acceptance and qabul. So the first two we took so far were what? Ilm, knowledge, and yaqeen, certainty. Okay? Jazakumullah khairan. Any uh, comments or questions or corrections before we close? From our brothers or sisters? Uh, this book, I think I had somebody bring it for me from America. It's my little copy. Um, maybe they have it at Darrell Corner Bookstore. I'm not sure. They have some of Jamal Sarabozo's publications. Yeah, You can check Darrell Corner Bookstore. They used to have a table here. I don't think they have it anymore. But uh, they have a branch in PJ. Uh, section 13, I think it is, 14, section 14, near the Round Mosque. And they have another branch in Ampang Park. Yeah, Park. So the book is called, He Came to Teach You Your Religion by Dr. Jalad Zaragoza. It's a very, uh, you know, good one for all of us to go through to lay down the proper foundations, inshallah. Any other questions or comments? Um, what 
what you are mentioning when you are about the death of the Shabbat Yahweh and about uh, late pregnancy, as to understand the certain conditions, basic conditions. Um, let's say you think that your brother is supposed to eat down, uh, you know, in the country, they will not take uh, the Shabbat. Is it necessary that they have to first be explained about those certain conditions before they take the Shabbat? Not necessarily, no, because those can be fulfilled without mentioning them explicitly. So, for me, before I give anyone a shahada, I already explain to them what does it mean so they have the knowledge. And then I ask them, are they certain and sure that they believe in it and accept it and they want to take the shahada? So it's like we, we clear out those conditions without explicitly explaining to them these are seven conditions that must be met and so on. The Messenger Salah said would never mention these seven just like that in the list. But rather they've been pulled from the various sayings of the Prophet Sallallahu and from his ayat, from the ayat of the Quran. Yeah? Uh, you need you need to like ensure that they are being fulfilled. Yeah, be be, be, it, be it directly or indirectly, inshallah. Yeah. So um, explaining what does it mean, you know, explaining what uh, uh, this kind of uh, commitment means. Yeah, that they are ready to accept, they are ready to submit, they are ready to live in accordance with it, and so on. So yeah, a lot of that, as we mentioned also for, for, for the Arabs in the Messenger Sallallahu time, they could gather that linguistically already. So even when they would just hear the statement, the delegation would come and say, what are you calling to? He would just say this statement. They said, wow, that's a big one. What are you calling to? It's not easy. Because it means switching over and changing our lifestyle. They understood that it was a big change and that people would lose that. People had something to lose because they were benefiting from corruption and so on in the way the system was. And it's the same thing today. Yeah, any other comments or questions? I thought I saw a hand maybe from the ladies. There's a microphone there if anyone wants to ask. <coughs> okay, we end there inshallah. Jazakallah khayman. Subhanakallah wa bihamdi. Ashadu la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.